Our fourth panel is a kind of continuation for yesterday's panels. It's basically linking them all together and talking about the global value chain and the free zones connection. So ladies and gentlemen, a global value chain are shaping new trends, we all agree on that, and the international trade, which affect company strategies and national development policies. Therefore, it's crucial that policymakers and entrepreneurs involved in the development of trade and FDI policies understand that countries do not anymore compete on products, but on activities along the value chain. The correct understanding of such trends from the free zones will create the ideal scenario for them to be integrated in the global value chains. On this topic, please welcome our moderator and keynote speaker, Gary Giraffi, Professor of Sociology and Founding Director of the Center on Globalization, Governance and Competitiveness of Duke University in USA. Our panelists for this session are Gokhan Akinji, a global product leader of the World Bank Group. Please. Hernando Jose Gomez, former Colombian ambassador to WTO in Colombia. Martin Ibarra, vice chairman at World FZO in Colombia. And Shimi Kwalowski, Senior Trade Economist at the Organization for the Economic Cooperation of Development in France. Over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would again like to, uh, on behalf of all the panelists, thank the uh, host and organizers of this uh, conference uh, on uh, opportunities for the free zone of the future. I think the panels yesterday were excellent. We had a lot of good perspectives, and today we want to continue this discussion. But I think this particular panel partly has a responsibility for trying to bring together some of the pieces we heard about yesterday. Uh, our title is Global Value Chains and how they facilitate uh, opportunities for the free zones of the future. So we're going to run the panel uh, like the ones yesterday. I'm going to provide some initial remarks to try to orient us in a bit more detail to the concept of global value chains and use a couple small country, big country examples of how countries uh, use global value chains and use uh, free zones as part of development. Then we're going to turn over to the panelists. I'll have a couple rounds of uh, questions for the panelists. Uh, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So as you're hearing things said in the session, if you've got good questions, jot them down and remember them because you will have an opportunity at the end to ask the panelists uh, some questions. So we've been using this um, framework of global value chains as a way to situate free zones of the future. And I think it's a particularly useful framework because it brings together what companies do in these complex global supply chains we've been hearing about. But it also says that these global supply chains provide opportunities for development from the countryside. So what I want to spend a few minutes doing is helping us understand how this notion of global value chains helps us create a, a development agenda that brings together the perspectives of companies and the perspectives of countries. In many ways, global value chains is linking globalization to local economic development. And I think if we view it from those two perspectives, the global economy, and countries that are trying to participate in the global economy, these free zones of the future are a kind of meeting point. They're a place where these two trends come together, where companies and their strategies link up with particular places around the world. And those places have their own objectives, priorities, goals for development. So I want to talk a little bit about how we can put these two pieces 
uh, together. The framework of global value chains has been around for about 20 years. People started developing this notion as they tried to analyze globalization in the mid-1990s, looking at the process of outsourcing of production by multinational companies. Uh, and that was a, a view of the world economy where industries were becoming fragmented and located in every corner of the world. Uh, over time, people have developed more uh, specific tools to talk about how these global value chains are organized. And so as we think about the framework, I think it's helpful to see it as giving us a top-down perspective and a bottom-up perspective. The top-down perspective is this perspective on global industries, how they're organized, who the lead firms are, what the strategies of lead firms are. Yesterday we heard a good bit about that, especially from the Airbus example. But the other side of global value chains that the free zones of the future is touching on is this bottom-up perspective. Countries are involved in the global economy through different kinds of industries, and countries want to use things like free zones or global value chains as a way to plot a way to improve their competitiveness uh, and promote local development. So I think that bottom-up perspective is very useful. So the two key concepts in global value chains are how global industries are organized and governed by lead firms and how countries can try to upgrade economically, socially, and environmentally. And I'll say a few words about each and then give a couple country examples. Uh, one of the nice things about setting up the, uh, the panel is in one of the, in the bulletin that you got with your conference materials, there were several articles about global value chains and development. And in the first article, uh, there's some of the slides that I'm going to talk about here. So I'm going to be very brief in what I say about the slides because you can read more in the bulletin. But in terms of how global industries are organized, this is one framework uh, of governance strategies or types of industries that have been used by academics and researchers and policymakers to analyze global industries. On the far left, we have uh, an illustration of traditional markets where you would have lots of buyers, lots of sellers. Price would determine how goods are exchanged. Spot markets for oil still work this way to some degree. Some commodities are in these kinds of markets, but most global industries aren't organized as traditional markets anymore. We have big companies playing critical roles at different parts of these industries. So we really need to introduce this concept of lead firms or market powers to understand how industries work. And if we go to the far right, the other side of the continuum, this notion of hierarchy that refers to multinational companies that set up supply chains with subsidiaries that they own. And that's a kind of familiar model in automobiles. We had a nice example yesterday with Airbus. A lot of those subsidiaries are owned by Airbus. But in the middle, we have lots of different kinds of market structures where you have lead firms working with independent suppliers or contractors around the world. And nowadays, about 60 to 80 percent of global trade is done according to those different types of networks, modular networks, relational captive. I won't go into detail on explaining those too much, but to just say this is a tool we can use to analyze different kinds of industries and how those might relate to free zones and suppliers or supply bases. I think a more important concept that we've heard about yesterday is this notion of upgrading. We heard a lot yesterday that we now have to think about how do you link goods and services in free zones of the future and in these industries. And one of the things that this uh, diagram, often called a smile curve, tries to illustrate is if we look at value added uh, on the vertical axis, so as you move up that vertical axis, you capture more value added. One of the ideas is that production itself, just making goods, has become relatively low value added in the global economy. Lots of places and companies have gotten very good at making things. But the higher value activities are often pre-production and post-production services. The initial person that created this smile curve 
was the CEO of Acer, a Taiwanese computer company. And he was concerned that as Asian countries in particular got very good at making sophisticated products like computers and hard disk drives, they were essentially becoming high-tech commodities. So in order for companies and places to move up the value chain, they needed to be able to add in R&D and design and logistics and finance and marketing. And that's some of what we heard yesterday. This idea of free zones of the future means that you have to be able to bundle together companies that could provide these different kinds of capabilities, being able to make things well, but also being able to add in the services uh, that go with that. And one final notion of upgrading we heard a lot about, and I think it's built into the concept of free zones of the future, economic progress, development, efficiency is a very important goal. And a lot of the free zones are focused on how do you come up with diversified exports that are highly efficient in the global market. But increasingly, people are saying that economic upgrading by itself is not enough, that companies and countries are looking to be able to add different elements of social upgrading and environmental upgrading to what they're doing economically to get a fuller notion of inclusive development, sustainable development, and dynamic economic growth. So I think this broader vision of combining economic, social, and environmental is part of what's built into the free zones of the future, and that's very much part of the global value chain framework. How do countries and companies uh, match up against these kinds of objectives. And of course, everybody's looking for that sweet spot where these different kinds of upgrading strategies overlap. So let me give two examples, two types of examples. One, I want to go back to Costa Rica. I didn't plan it in conjunction with our Costa Rican colleagues and the, the Minister of Commerce who gave us a nice introduction to Costa Rica yesterday. But Costa Rica is a very useful case because it's a relatively small country less than 5 million people, but it's a country that has targeted high-tech development, green development, a sort of more ambitious set of goals as part of where it wants to go. And it's doing it based on free trade zones as a critical part of the economy. So I think if we take a look at one of the examples of how Costa Rica has tried to do this looking at medical devices, It'll give us some of the elements that we want to talk about more generally with free zones of the future. And many of the elements we see in the Costa Rica case are also true of UAE, by the way. And I'll, I'll just make a couple of comparisons, but maybe panelists will think of other country examples. And then finally, I want to just end with a couple big country examples, Mexico and Brazil, just to illustrate the differences that small countries, big countries have in terms of global value chains. And, and I'm just going to use a few slides that are in that bulletin. So. I'm going to just highlight a couple issues that I think are important as we think about free zones of the future. One issue with free zones is that the free zones are set up typically to promote exports. And when countries are trying to promote exports, they actually now have a double objective. At the beginning, when you just had export processing zones in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, often those export processing zones were viewed as ways to create employment and to increase the quantity of exports. And that was an important goal to create foreign exchange, create jobs, et cetera. But nowadays, countries have become much more ambitious in saying they want to improve the quality of exports as well as the quantity. And I think the quality of exports is often referred to as the technological content. Are we exporting goods that move up the technology ladder? So in this example, from Costa Rica of their export growth in medical devices, one of the sectors they targeted, the blue section at the bottom refers to relatively simple uh, medical devices um, that are uh, called disposables, single-use items like surgical gloves or catheter tubes or syringes. So those are the low-tech uh, types of devices. Next up, the technology ladder would be surgical instruments, things that are made out of specialty alloys. They can be used in multiple times, but they have to be sterilized, and the sterilization is a pretty complicated process. Next category up, and probably the most important, are uh, what are called therapeutic devices. Those are any medical devices that we put into the human body. So everything from hearing aids and pacemakers to artificial joints, cardiac, uh, devices, et cetera. So that's much higher technology, much more regulated. And finally, you have 
capital equipment, like MRI machines sold to hospitals. So one thing we can do in looking at countries and medical devices is we could say what proportion of their exports are these higher tech type of devices versus lower tech. And in this slide, you can see Costa Rica has actually done well on both quantity and quality. The quantity of their medical device exports has been growing, but so has the technological, the higher tech categories in medical devices. But an important question that I think we need to keep in mind is what's behind trade figures? What uh, explains how Costa Rica has been able to do this kind of progress? And I think that brings us to looking at foreign direct investment. Uh, we had a lot of discussion yesterday about investment and trade and how those things are related. So we did a study for the government of Costa Rica at my center at Duke University. Karina Fernandez-Stark, who was on the first panel yesterday, was one of the uh, researchers. Penny Bamber was very involved in this study and others. And one of the things we did was interview uh, a large number of the medical device companies in Costa Rica. We asked them why they went there, what other places they were considering, and what were their strategies once they got in the country. And one of our findings was that if you divided the foreign firms that came into Costa Rica in terms of waves of investment over time, you saw that the initial companies that came in were doing the lower tech type of medical devices, the, dis the disposable devices. But the second generation of FDI that came in was doing the more advanced types of surgical instruments. And then that third wave of companies that was coming in in the uh, 2008, uh, 2004, 2008 period was moving into the higher tech types of therapeutic devices. And by the present, the most recent wave of foreign companies coming in were doing all of those kinds of high tech goods. So an important lesson, it seems to me, from countries trying to set up free zones is A, you have to be selective in terms of what kind of foreign direct investment you want to try to bring in. You have to track it to see how that relates to the kinds of technologies you're hoping would create to higher tech exports. But third, you have to also be aware of challenges that your success can create. So one of the things we can see from this map is that Costa Rica has been very, very successful at bringing in all the top medical device companies around the world. But it creates a problem. Costa Rica is only is four and a half million people. Most of these companies are located in free zones around the Central Valley, around San Jose. So this is also creating shortages, shortages of human capital. As they move more into these higher tech areas, they need more research personnel, top managers. They need more technicians. So one of the things that smaller countries have to deal with over time is how do you deal with the, uh, the influx and the pressures created around uh, human capital? Uh, how do you screen companies effectively? And a, an important topic is how do you create uh, the, the disinvestment, would almost be the, the right word. If you, if you look at a situation where you're crowded and if a country says, well, here's the type of multinationals or technologies we want, is there a way to reduce pressure by getting the lower technology companies to move elsewhere. South Korea dealt with this problem very much in the 1990s. They became the most successful exporter in the world of athletic footwear, 1980s, 1990s. Nike, Reebok, Adidas, all those companies were there. And at a certain point, the South Korean government said, this is great, these are good exports, but South Korea wants to move into biotech. They want to move into advanced electronics, et cetera. So we want to bring in a newer set of companies. And the government used export licenses. If you're going to export in South Korea, you needed an export license. So they basically said footwear companies aren't going to get export licenses. Move those industries elsewhere so we can create room for the newer ones. In China, they had a much bigger space to work with. So all the, the uh, initial set of export companies and apparel, footwear, toys in Guangdong province in the south they became very successful, but after a while, the government said, we want to now move to higher technology. And they created a set of mechanisms, incentives to push those companies into the interior provinces. So countries have to deal with this kind of real world problem. Final uh, way to look at this is we talked yesterday about strategies. This is just an example of one of the companies that came into Costa Rica and what its uh, profile of investments looked like over time, how it moved up a technology ladder, but when we talked to a company like this, they said, well, one problem we see as we get more involved in a country is we can use this value chain to spot gaps, areas where we need new investment. One of those gaps was sterilization. 
In the early years, Costa Rica was making medical devices. They had to export them to the U.S. for sterilization because it was some advanced technologies, bring them back to Costa Rica. Inefficient process. We heard a little bit about that yesterday. So after a while, Costa Rica was able to bring in two sterilization companies that filled that gap. And actually, big companies like this one here helped push that. Final point about Costa Rica, and then I'm going to move to a final example and turn it over to the panel. To make this kind of, these kinds of zones work with such a dynamic set of investment changes and, and trade policy changes, you really need a coordinated team on the countryside. In Costa Rica, they have the Ministry of Commerce, they have uh, Procomer, which is a kind of foreign investment, uh, which is a trade promotion agency, and they have another organization called Sinde, which is a foreign investment promotion agency. Those three agencies have to work together very well in order to create this kind of a dynamic. And UAE, I understand there's a lot of uh, very uh, good specialized agencies doing the same thing. If you look at Singapore or other countries that have been successful, you find the same. Government agencies need to be well organized around a vision or a goal to make this kind of program work effectively. And just a final example, whenever countries are promoting these kinds of uh, industries or free zones, they're always worried about who they're competing with and who they're going to compete with as they get more successful. In medical devices, the three most, the three most successful exporters of medical devices are Mexico, Ireland, and Singapore. Mexico sells to the U.S., Ireland sells to the EU, Singapore sells to Asia. So in some key ways, Costa Rica, Mexico, both sending products to the U.S., they're competing with one another. But because Mexico is so much bigger, five times the uh, number of medical device exports, Mexico has created universities to train people that actually could help relieve that human capital shortage I was mentioning in Costa Rica. So one of the things countries are looking for is how can you collaborate with other countries in areas where you're, you have some similar interests. Brazil uh, has a smaller number of medical device exports, but it doesn't mean that the zones in Brazil are any less powerful. Brazil's domestic market is the biggest driver of the medical device industry there. They have the largest public hospital system in the world. And the public hospitals provide a lot of the demand. So yesterday we heard don't just look at zones for export only, but in a lot of the bigger countries, zones can also supply the domestic market. That's happening very much in Brazil. So when we compare a Costa Rica, Mexico, Brazil, we see different ways to approach the same industry. And let me just end with two slides, one on aerospace, one on automotive, that picks up some themes we heard yesterday. This is a picture of Mexico's uh, aeronautic industry. And when we uh, heard the presentation from Habib at uh, Airbus, he explained to us how Airbus is a big global player all around the world. But if you look at a bigger country like Mexico, we can see many parts of Mexico that are tied into the aerospace industry. But one big difference, if we think about it from a zones perspective, some of these areas, like Caretero, which is focused around supplying parts for Bombardier, the Canadian company, they have, sorry, they have a very tight relationship between those suppliers and Bombardier, and it's given them a chance to develop more advanced capabilities. Other parts of Mexico are export primarily. Uh, Baja California, for example. So we have different kinds of zones, different kinds of capabilities inside the same country. And if we look at a case like automobile production, and I just want to highlight one other point that came up yesterday, I think increasingly global value chains are becoming regional, not just global. If you look at this picture of the American automobile industry, uh, I think we heard in the uh, presentation yesterday from uh, uh, the director of uh, the North American Free, Tro Free Trade Zone uh, organization that about 64% of automobile production is in the U.S., maybe 19% in Mexico, the rest in Canada. But together, they really form part of a North American automobile industry in the same way that we have an East Asian electronics industry or we have a European auto industry. So if we're going to set up free zones, we have to think about how the zones can coordinate with other countries in the region. And I think this regional perspective is another dimension of free zones of the future. So I just wanted to give these examples as a way to provide context for our panelists. So I'm now going to turn over, I'll, I'll come and, and ask the panelists to help uh, illuminate some of these uh, issues a little bit more. But the main point I want to make here is free 
zones of the future are not just about uh, helping to bring global supply chains to a particular place, but they're also linking up to national development objectives. And the zones of the future have to help find ways where both companies and countries can move up these value chains in an efficient manner. And I think we've got lots of good examples for how that can be done. So let me turn to the panel now and we'll ask some questions and hear from our panelists what they think about this. So we have a very uh, uh, distinguished uh, set of panelists with lots of experience from different kinds of organizations and institutions. So I'm going to ask them to tell us a little bit about what they have learned about these issues uh, from their own experience. So uh, let me start with Gokan uh, Kinsey from the World Bank. Uh, and we had been hearing yesterday that these free zones are heterogeneous, very different types, but they have also had an evolution over time. Uh, and could you tell us a little bit from your experience in the World Bank what kind of a framework you use or how we can think about the evolution of these free zones over time, any typologies that would be useful as countries are trying to position themselves uh, with regard to this, uh, this set of issues? Uh, thank you, Gary. This is an interesting question. I think when, I, when you were talking about the country examples, I was trying to make a list of the different terminologies I have heard on zones, you know, export processing zones, special economic zones, free ports, ICT parks, agri-zones, innovation parks, free trade zones, etc., etc. So that actually really speaks to the diversity of the instrument and somehow to the fact that we have used this instrument very effectively or not and to the way it actually changed over time and in many cases in response to how industries work. Um, so. In that sense, zones actually fit in that metro space between where we have the countrywide reforms, such as education, improving investment climate, etc., and firm level micro interventions where government doesn't have the lead, but it's mostly private sector. So the metro space is where the governments play catalytic role to really help form clusters linked to GVCs and use spatial tools like SEZs as one of those to bring in investment, create jobs, etc. So in there we see that zones seem to have three phases of evolution. The first is what most people think when they think about zones is the export processing zones model. Uh, while this model has been used very effectively by a number of our client countries, this is the original model, the enclave model. As you mentioned, it is the version where most countries aim to bring in foreign direct investment, and catalyze exports and create jobs. That has been used very effectively, but there has also been many failures because of the enclave approach. And in many cases, maybe I would say labor arbitrage. And that model was mostly regulated, governed, operated by uh, governments. And there wasn't enough thought that went into actual, how do we make this a strong economic tool? Then we see a second phase where we could call this economic zones 2.0, which responded to changes in how industries work over the last couple of decades and to the fact that we actually have a very different world than 20 years ago with regional trade agreements, global trade agreements, reductions in basically barriers to foreign investment and otherwise. And the response to that has been to really focus on more diverse, more open, multi-use, multi-sector SEZs that actually enabled different sectors and different type of users to commingle. And this actually started opening up uh, towards sales into the domestic market and thinking more about linkages into the domestic market. And there has still been changes in that model because that model was still focused on the zone itself the sites and the locations, the first two models. I call them more project type zone approaches. What we see more recently, and I think this is a response to the ability to link to the larger government agenda, and especially since the last crisis, there has been strong demand on using zones as 
more effective tools as part of overarching industrialization or diversification agendas to create jobs and link to GVCs more effectively. So in that model, I think this is also the future of zones where governments are actually, and we are looking at this, what do we need to do in and outside the zones to bring that ecosystem together? Because unless we actually look at the sectors, the demand side much more effectively and understand the needs that we need to tackle not only inside the zones but outside the zones, such as what kind of skills do we need to actually catalyze those investments? How do we more effectively link to domestic investments but also help grow the domestic sector so they can actually become more effective suppliers? How do we look at the environmental and social arena not as risks but actually as opportunities to bring these investors in by creating an effective environment? So the third version of zones is an open environment where we look at the policy instruments that are not only in the zone sphere but outside the zone sphere as part of the larger industrialization agenda. And one component of that is actually also this whole low carbon and green approach. If anybody watched the news this morning, it was on BBC, I think, scientists recently discovered that five islands in Solomon Islands area in the Pacific uh, area disappeared. So it, climate change is basically is not something we can avoid anymore. So there is, I think, a role for instruments and opportunity to use them much more effectively to address the climate change agenda by creating an environment where we can actually do some meaningful uh, policy actions as well as use the private sector's ability to adapt in a fashion where we address these in a measurable way going forward. Excellent. Thank you. I think that kind of typology is very useful to help us organize a sense of this diversity. So let me turn next to uh, Martin Ibarra, who has a lot of experience in setting up zones uh, and these kinds of organizations, including uh, the World Free Zone Organization. So Martin, as you look at this evolution that Gokhan was uh, identifying, what do you see as some of the major challenges these zones, uh, especially as we're moving towards the zones of the future, are confronting? How would you uh, focus on key issues that we need to pay attention to? Uh, thank you, Gary. For me, it's a privilege to be in this very qualified panel. If you, if you see in the last 20 years, the, the composition of the international trade is changing a lot. Today, the 70% of the international trade are industrial goods at its parts. That means that that part has to move around the world. The concept made in the world means that a product that is finalizing in one country maybe had input of several co different countries. For example, when, when you said that China export $2.2 trillion, this is true, but it's not true at the same time. Because if you measure the value added of those $2.2 trillion, maybe China will, be, we, will export 30%. <laughs> because the 70% of those goods move around the world. And that is a very important concept. Because the problem of the international trade is not, already, in this moment, the import taxes is reducing. It used to be 15%, now are 8%. It's no longer the freight. It used to be 20%, maybe now is 8%. The real problem is to cross the border. Uh, the International Trade Center uh, have several studies that means that to cross the border sometimes means a value around the 20% of, of the value of the goods. The non-tariff -tariff barriers is very difficult. And the, 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 the first principle in international trade is not export taxes, even administrative taxes. And the real uh, means of the, of the free trade zone is to allow that the inputs move very, free, very freely around the world to make possible the concept made in the world. Uh, there are some surveys in China that uh, said that if the special economic zone will stop, the 70% of the export of China will stop in the next 30 days. This is very important. If the 3,000 free zone in the world stops, maybe the international trade 
collapse. Uh, if you see, when the GATT was approved, there, uh, there was 50 free zones around the world. When the WTO was approved, there was 500 free zones around the world. Today, there are more than 3,000 free zones around the world with 300 million of people. It's not possible to imagine the international trade today without free zones. And what is going to be in the next 10 or 20 years? For that reason, the free zone provides the neutrality that the Made in the World program need to be done in the, today and especially in, in the future. The most sophisticated uh, and the more advanced economy is a country, the more, the more uh, automatic procedure to cross the border. The less developed the country, very difficult to cross the border. I, I go and have a very big, good experience about that. And if you see the, the international institutions advancing the concept uh, in front of the, of the free zone a lot in the last five years. For example, there are some incentives that are forbidden in the WTO. The, the, the free zone are not forbidden. The, the free zone. Some incentive, for example, the exemption of income tax related with export is not allowed. But now the WTO loved the free zones because in the last ministerial meeting in Hawaii, the, the only thing that was approved was the trade facilitation. And is not any other instrument different than the free zones to help the trade facilitation. For example, the International Labor Organization used to hate the free zones because in some free zone many years ago, they don't pay very well the workers. Today, there are studies that show that the workers in the free zone is paid 20 or 30 percent more than out the free zone. And now, the International Labor Organization loves the free zone. And the next task is the OECD. And that is a very, very important task. Uh, uh, the World Trade Organization made a survey a few months ago and showed that uh, there are almost 1,000 free zones in OECD countries. Of those, you do know, there are 34 members of OECD. 23 has free zones, 20, and three free ports. For example, there are some countries like Chile, Polonia, Korea, Estonia, Israel, Turkey, that have zero tax in free zone in front of the local income tax that are uh, higher. There are three countries that have reduction of income tax. Slovenia, 10 in front of 21% in the internal market. Portugal, 5 in front of 23% in the internal market. And Spain in Canarias, 4% in front of 28% in the internal market. But some of the OECD countries like the United States that have uh, 500 foreign trade zone as subzones. One of those alliance have a triple free zone. It's the first triple free zone in the world. It's a federal free zone, it's a, a free zone of the state and a free zone of the municipality. They have the three, three regimes at the same time. And it's a OECD countries. For that reason, I think the real task in the future will be to sit with the OECD and to build together how we con can combine the criteria of the ECD, OECD countries with the facilitation of trade, with the Made in the, uh, in the Globe program, and the free zone in the future. Excellent. Thank you, Martin. So I think that gave us a very excellent diagnosis of challenges facing the zones. Uh, let me turn to uh, Hernando Gomez, who's had a lot of experience in Colombia from a country perspective, also Colombia's representative to the World Trade Organization, uh, and ask Hernando to tell us a little bit about the public policy dimensions that have become important in taking advantage of these free zones as they've been evolving. Okay, uh, thank you, Gary, and thanks to the World Free Zones Organization for this invitation to this important conference and panel. Uh, we have learned in these couple of days that Global value chains are very demanding in terms of uh, government procedures, regulations, in terms of uh, infrastructure, specialized infrastructure required for their operations, and obviously also in terms of tax neutrality, that's something that my friend Martin Gustavo Ibarra stresses a lot. 
Mm, on the other hand, in developing countries, free zones are like pockets of efficiency, pockets that are competitiveness, where uh, they have a special regulations, where they don't suffer of all the red tape that usual normal firms have to suffer in, in, in the territory, and many of them linked to, unfortunately, to corruption and situations of that sort. So, in the end, free zones are like a natural landing port for all these global value chains in, in our countries. But the question would be there, okay, we have seen that some uh, emerging countries have been able to attract some global value chains. Uh, but in general, they are in the manufacturing and in the assembly parts. And the idea is, okay, how do, can we scale into the upper parts of the curve where value added is more interesting in the area of research and development, design, marketing, branding, etc. The one a figure of those that you showed in your presentation. So I was thinking, okay, what are the kind of measures, interventions that the government can 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 uh, uh, can start doing to facilitate the attraction of this type of uh, foreign companies that uh, are international leaders in these global value chains, and I want to refer basically to mention six areas where I think that the, the, the government can intervene successfully. It's not any type of intervention, obviously, but six types. One that I think is the most important is to promote research and development incentives and facilities in free zones. No? I think that's the most, in, in the end, the sustainability of these uh, free zones and the ability to maintain these global value chains will depend on their capacity to develop R&D and, and, and to attract those kinds of facilities. Um, that has been already, excuse me, that has been already invented and uh, there are a lot of uh, tax uh, breaks uh, for companies that are very frequently used in developed countries, less used in developing countries, and basically that's something that we can copy. And actually in Colombia we have copied that in the past few years. But also we have to, to attract human capital from the academic area. And uh, one thing that I was thinking is, in, is that uh, it would be interesting if we could also recognize in our local universities, at least in our public universities, as a tenure track, not only publications, but also the work that these professors may be doing with companies in terms of uh, doing applied work for them and developing technical capacities and, and, and innovation in terms of uh, processes, in terms of managerial skills, in terms of new products. So that would be something that a first area where I think it could be very useful to have this participation of the government. Second area is promoting training skills development programs for actually potential employees of the free zones. Uh, free zones are increasingly specializing in certain areas, so they need specialized uh, skills there. Uh, I, th I take as an example the Tanger Automotive City uh, free zone that uh, has more than 12,000 persons uh, graduated per year in 22 dedicated facilities. They are graduating around 1,500 engineers per year. So that, that's, that's amazing what they're doing. And one of the main issues that we, uh, you see from uh, the, the um, foreign, uh, foreign companies complain in our countries is the lack of trained personnel that they can, uh, the, where they can pick their, 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 their employees. A third area is to provide provide more research and information on global markets, uh, uh, trends and opportunities for uh, local companies that could engage in this, uh, uh, with these uh, uh, big companies in, in global value chains. And as we all know, all our countries have uh, export promotion agencies, but unfortunately these export promotion agencies usually are looking into finished goods, into consumption goods, and uh, they lack a vision in, 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 in this area of global value chain. So probably they start dedicating more of their resources to take a look at this uh, of, of these uh, trading intermediate goods that could be also 
a plus to develop these, uh, these, these uh, exercises in, in our countries. A fourth area that I think would be interesting would be to promote a greater and better use of information and communication technologies in free, in free zones. There is a nice example in the Philippines, in the PESA, the Philippine Economic Zone Authority, that couples world-class custom procedures with an extraordinary local logistics that allows products to have a fast turnaround. In, in some cases, it's just 96 hours that to complete the whole production cycle. And now they are to even trying to lower that to 72 hours. So that's amazing. From the moment that you import the intermediate goods, you process it, and you export it, in less than 96 hours, there's a whole turnaround. So that kind of thing is something that we have to promote, using better use of information and communication uh, abilities uh, there. Uh, a fifth area that I think would be important for the government uh, to, to try to, to promote is to promote synergies between companies in, in the free zones. Fortunately, in many, uh, in many cases in our free zones, we have uh, similar companies producing the similar products and they don't talk to each other because they may get ahead of, of the other. So you have to promote this kind of conversation. The world market is so large, so big, and our companies in general are relatively small that there are opportunities for everybody. So that kind of thing of promoting conversations uh, between these, uh, these companies in the free zones and encouraging the development of, uh, of supply chains. Yesterday, um, Karina Fernandez talked about the experience in Chile. That was very interesting how they developed these uh, supply chains for their extractive mining industries. And uh, basically, with a small subsidy of the government trying to help these companies to uh, have a better uh, managerial skills inside their companies and participating in open innovation challenges, they have been able to develop an industry that already is exporting uh, more than $50 million a, a year when five, ten years ago it was zero. No? And, they are producing, and they are selling more than $500 million to the mining companies in Chile. So that's something that, that we can learn from and, and try to, to develop. Because obviously, I understand yesterday we were discussing that uh, we don't want to create a dual economy. You know? We don't want to create local companies attending like more like informal type of the, of, the, of the economy and these modern companies attending the international market. We want to, domestic markets to be also involved in, this, in the benefits of this development. So I think that's a fifth area that we can, the, that we can, uh, that we can exploit adequately. A, an example here in, in this uh, promotion of synergies is uh, the Port Klang Free Zone in Malaysia. Uh, that in order to complement manufacturing activities, they encourage the growth of regional distribution centers and international procurement centers for a smoother supply chain. So that's the kind of activities that, that, could, be, that could be promoted. And a sixth element, the sixth and final element that I want to, 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 to bring here uh, to this panel is to facilitate the development of financial instruments because yesterday the the representative of Airbus was stressing, okay, I need quality products, but I need them in the quantities that I, that, that, that I require. So in that sense, uh, that means that, okay, we may have several small and medium enterprises, but they need to grow, they, or I need many of them coordinating the same type of products, or I need a large investment, so our local companies were, are going to be able to provide in uh, the products in the numbers that are required. So in that sense, we have to develop some portfolio investors, some investment funds that will allow this kind of, uh, that will allow us to avoid the, that the financial area becomes a bottleneck for the integration to these uh, global uh, value chains. Mm, finally, I three, Three more, three, three more ideas, mm, if you allow me. Yeah, 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 yeah. we'll make it short. Um, so I will just reduce it to one, one okay. idea, just, just in to, uh, to comply with the time. Uh, I think that like a few years ago, 
we were thinking that okay, because of the expansion of the internet and uh, and, uh, and, and and how fast uh, things were moving around the world, that geography won't would not matter anymore. I think that as the different parts of the world level off in, in all parts of the world we're going to have very efficient uh, export processing zones, free zones, etc. that uh, the advantage of being near the other, the, the market, the demand markets, is going to, 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 to be important again. No, even if now the, the shipping costs come down from 20% to 6-8%, Six or eight percent is a lot in the yeah. end, no? So uh, I think that, the, as you were mentioning, regional value chains are going to become very important in the future when we have uh, equivalent levels of efficiency among the different, uh, the different uh, free zones in the world. Excellent. Thank you. I want to turn to Shemek Kowalski because the OECD has been a leader in measuring aspects of these global value chains. And as we've heard about their complexity, Policymakers need information tools to be able to track things, especially this concept of increasing domestic value added and, and value chain. So can you tell us something about, from your experience at OECD, which tools you think are most useful and, and how advances in measurement are helping policymakers and firms alike understand what's going on in these value chains? Thank you, Gary. Uh, it's an excellent question. It's a pleasure to be here. And I agree we don't do enough at the OECD on special zones, and it's interesting data showing that OECD countries are themselves engaging in some of these policies. And one reason I'm here is that my management believes that we should be doing more and should be finding out more about uh, uh, this kind of policy, and uh, I'm happy to be here and to be learning from you and to liaise afterwards, you know, to do more work together. Uh, let me, uh, as Gary mentioned, contribute a, a slightly different perspective which I don't think was emphasized enough at this con con conference so far, namely the, the, the perspective of uh, collecting and analyzing comparative data. Uh, why do we need to do this? Well, we had a lot of discussions uh, mentioning particular companies, particular zones, regions, or countries, but in fact what we come up with after such discussions is a long list of things that should be considered without actually being able to prioritize. So increasingly at the OECD, what our approach is uh, to be able to know something uh, about uh, an issue, we need to measure it on a comparative basis. So that's where we were basically concentrating our efforts over the last five years, working together with the World Trade Organization uh, to put together a number of data sets uh, on national accounts, national input output tables and world trade data at the detailed level to come up with something that we call OECD WTO trading value added database. It covers 62 countries. Uh, one of them is a composite regions rest of the world. So basically you have a picture of global GDP and flows of value added from the source through the path where it's crossing, it's being used by other countries and where it's being consumed. So it's a global database on value added flows uh, which can be used to analyze value chains and in fact as I will argue in, in my uh, second point it can be also used to uh, get insights on future free zone policies. Uh, so there's many applications of this data and as Bernard Hookman uh, showed you in session two yesterday you can uh, take the exports of a country and you can decompose it into foreign value added because we know that what country exports sometimes is foreign value added and in the case of China it's quite high as, as you mentioned. Uh, another part is the domestic value added that can be used by other countries for processing and exports and then other components. So you have, that's one uh, example of an application of this data. The way one application, another application that I want to discuss today is uh, trying to figure out what are the determinants of domestic value added in exports. So this is something that is called upgrading, you know. What can a country do to maximize the value of its labor and capital that it, that it exports that's being used by other countries. So what we've done, we've used this data. It's quite a lot of data points and it's actually stretching from 95 to 2011. Uh, and try to link it to some factors uh, that we can measure. So what determines domestic value added in exports? 
and you will not be surprised by the results, but geography matters, so being, able, being close to a final demand and being, able to imp, uh, being close to inputs matters, productivity matters, uh, availability of skilled labor matters, and backward and forward linkages to the domestic economy matter, but also what matters uh, as much as each of these factors is very important is access to foreign inputs. So that's, that's emphasizing the, the GVC story. So the GVC story is that, is that you don't have to have the knowledge and all the capacity in your country to be globally competitive. The competitiveness is determined at the global level. So you draw on comparative advantages of other countries by sourcing inputs, you add whatever you're best at doing, and this is how you can basically support domestic capacity to, to add value and to benefit your economy from this activity. So the fact, for example, that skilled labor in our study seems to be as important in accessing foreign inputs, what kind of, what kind of implications does it have for, for free zone policies? Well, first point that I want to make is that maximizing domestic shares in exports doesn't really make so much sense because even if you have a small share and you do it on a, on a mass scale, as is done in many uh, export processing zones or in China, that can be a very profitable activity. So let's not downplay this, this kind of basic role that uh, special zones can fulfill. So if you look at the free zones, you could have the, the classic ones which link uh, the domestic location with foreign inputs, so the export processing zone. You could have the ones that focus more on infrastructure and uh, enabling environment, and you can have the, the really advanced zones that are really, you know, kind of uh, laboratories uh, where you extend the good policies to the rest of the economy. So the way I see what are the conclusions from this analysis for the future uh, uh, free zones is that really the facilitation of access to foreign inputs has mattered in the past and is likely to matter for many uh, developing economies in the years to come. So it's not, it's not worth throwing out, you know, basically the trade facilitation and uh, allowing, uh, lowering the cost of, uh, of, of imported inputs. But ultimately to profit fully from an economy's um, riches, the zones will need to open up and link and we'll see uh, this is particularly important for the services sector where uh, whilst in manufacturing, it's important to be able to access foreign inputs and assemble them and add a little bit of value. In the services sector, it's increasingly important to be able to draw on the domestic skilled labor infrastructure and to be, to be able to be linked to the domestic market. So just to sum up, uh, the free zone policy will depend on the level of development and the labor abundant uh, countries where the labor is still cheap, they still have a future in promoting the classical type of zones where they add uh, labor supply and reduce unemployment and therefore can, can add value. But in, in some developing countries where the, the costs of, of labor and other costs are already going up, they need to be looking forward and they need to be looking to the kind of infrastructure and enabling environment and linking it with the domestic economy. Uh, to be able to, they will not be able to compete on the labor cost, so they will be able to, com to compete on something else. So they need to think of their free zones in this dynamic perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so I think we've had an uh, excellent uh, set of perspectives on challenges, tools, opportunities of the free zone in the future. Uh, rather than me asking more questions, let me open it up to the floor and at least collect some questions or comments and, and given that we're a little short on time, maybe I might group them and just take whatever initial reactions we have and then see how panelists might want to respond to those if we have time. So let me take comments from the floor and we'll start over here on the right. And if you introduce yourself, that would that will help the panelists. Good morning, Gary. My name is Mehdi Tazi. I'm from Tangiers in Morocco. I had a question namely to you with respect to the case that you elaborated on Costa Rica. When you talked about the last phase or the last phase of development, you namely pointed at JVs. And I wanted to have your view on those JVs and do you think that that's a means to better anchor or provide more sustainability for the development of investment into free zones? So it was a JVs joint ventures? Or Absolutely. Was... Okay, Absolutely. fine, thanks. Let's take a couple more questions, comments, and uh, yes, uh, over here in a second. 
Uh, good morning and congratulations for this great panel. Uh, I am Lorenzo Beroa, I come from Mexico. And in Mexico, we, we have experienced like two different realities. One is the example of the auto industry, who, who has been a tremendous example of how well it has been integrated and how many, the, the local content, how high it is, and every time it's increasing. But, uh, f but, but, on, but on the other side, at the border level, all the maquiladora industry, for the last probably 20 years, we have not been able to increase the local content. I think it's 2% uh, out of all the, of the local, uh, the domestic uh, uh, component. Is there any ideas of how we could increase this and, and uh, incorporate especially Mexican companies to these export-oriented maquiladoras? Thank Great. you. Thank you. A question in the back, next row back. My name is Veda Askari from Iran. Uh, as we are approaching uh, to the end of the Congress, I find much more breathtaking topics and titles, especially the ones mentioned here. My question refers uh, mainly to Martin. Martin, you point uh, to the number, increasing number of free zones around the world. Uh, wouldn't it be, uh, I mean, a treat to the domestic manufacturers as uh, we are trying to increase in the number of free zones in a regional land? See, a question over here in the middle. Uh, thank you. Uh, very interesting debates. Uh, j just to push a bit and, and to tease, uh, I, I heard two theses. The first one, uh, Gary Fee, get out of industry, manufacture, go to services. Kowalski, hey, uh, there, there are still uh, jobs to be created in manufacture. And I remember uh, there are guys like Osman and Roderick who says, hey, don't go to services, there's no future. If you want to uh, develop your country, industrialization is key. What do you think? Great questions. See, maybe one more question, if we can get one, and then we'll let the, panel, we'll let the panelists take a crack at responding. We have one in the back there, please. Good morning, my name is Simon Sonu from Jobs and Dubai. Um, over the last couple of days, we've been discussing two main things, I believe. One is the place that free zones should occupy in the global value chain. And secondly, what is the future lies for free zones? What is the shape and form of free zones for the future? Um, I think the question to the panel is that if we really want free zones to contribute even more uh, in the global value chain, shouldn't we look at the operation in the way free zones are developed and operated? I think Gokan mentioned about uh, zones version number three, and Martin was talking about made in the world. Shouldn't we look at the model, at the very simple model that airlines and shipping lines use, i.e., airlines use very basically a global network of airports. Shipping lines use a global network of ports. Shouldn't we look, instead of standalone free zones, shouldn't we look at a global network of free zones which are accredited, which are connected, etc., so that this will help uh, organizations use um, these free zones better? Thank you. Thank you. So we've had a great set of questions, and I'll just ask each panelist to spend a minute or whatever, a minute or two to respond. And I'll just respond very quickly to one of the questions, the one about joint ventures in Costa Rica. I think these kinds of uh, joint ventures, especially as we are in higher technology industries, is an excellent way to organize the zones because it creates partnerships between international companies that are very experienced and local firms. But I think it also raises an important challenge of local supplier development. And one of the interesting things in Costa Rica is many of those subsidiaries of the multinational medical device companies are run by Costa Rican managers who in turn know other companies in Costa Rica who they feel could be good suppliers. And I find that kind of networking has been very useful in Costa Rica to try to bring the benefits of the zones to suppliers outside the zones. Let me turn to the panelists in the order that they spoke and pick whichever topic you felt most responds to your interest. So we'll start with Gokan. Very quickly, maybe about Simon and manufacturing or services, actually many of, many of the others. I think um, we need to really start looking at much more carefully in a more focused fashion, where is the market, who is the market, what are the sectors that we actually can catalyze more effectively and keep that in a sense of urgency and keep our focus and the policymakers focus in tune with the market demand. And once we understand what the market demand is about, what those sectors are, then actually you can design 
in and outside zones, the right ecosystems that would benefit Mexico maybe more effectively than now in some of these Mechaladorias. And it also goes into the manufacturing or services type of a question. It's not one or the other. I think those also researchers also say you need to really understand where the demand is. It may be a combination. But I think instead of going for a single source, one needs to create that flexible environment so that the industries and the private firms are flexible to move and decide and interchange between their investments. Thank you. Fernando. Uh, and Aquila's issue, just to, to take uh, another one, is um, basically our countries are many times stuck with, basic, with the manufacture or even just the assembly of the products. But uh, in some discussions that I have had with uh, the apparel industry, what they are trying to, in, to, to do is to start a little bit before in trying to help in the design of the, uh, of the garments it, themselves. And in that sense, helping the, multi the big multinationals, the Saras, the Gaps, whatever, you know, into having better, in, 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 uh, uh, better design clothing and also help them in the logistics, so they start offering to be, they, they, they will take care of putting the clothing and the apparel in different parts of the world, you know, it's part of their whole service. So when you start moving in those directions, you know, in both sides of the curve, probably you can start getting out just simply of being the maquila and the assembly of the product. Excellent. Martin. Yes. I will uh, answer the, the, the question of my friend from yes. Iran. Uh, the free zone of the past used to be like a jail, was forbidden the interaction with the local market. The free zone of the future will be integrated, more integrated with the local market. For example, in some countries, they consider exports when a local company sells some goods to the free zone and, and obtain the rebate and the, all the import-export systems for, for, for maintaining the tax neutrality for the, for the inputs. The second is some countries uh, uh, allow the, to make some process in the zone and the other half of the process inside the local market. Mm -hmm. Maintaining the free zone status, that means the, the, the free zone operator under his responsibility, even the government or the private operator, can allow to go the, the, the raw material when to the local market suffer some process and be exported again to the free zone. And it's a lot of opportunities to communicate between the free zone and, and the local industry. Uh, and the free zone itself has ha provided a lot of help for the small and medium industry. For example, there are cooperatives, co-ops, to import that 10, 20, 30 companies join to buy together and have the uh, stocks without taxes in the free zone, and we, we import the ones they need. Uh, for example, the use of free zone for infrastructure pro uh, projects like electricity, like ports, like airports, that will help all the industry. Uh, and even the local industry can set up the new projects in the free zones. Excellent. Chemek, please. Just very quickly on the manufacturing versus services. Uh, that's an excellent question. As you saw in uh, Gary's uh, smile curve, I mean, you see that services sectors, either the design and research and development or sales and marketing on the other side, they tend to have a higher value added as a share of the value of the product. And you could think of wanting to be there, for example, wanting to withdraw from maquilladoras and be there, but the question is whether you can do it because it, it re requires research and development and innovation and that's quite costly. So the question is where your comparative advantage is. And uh, so I would just reiterate that it really depends on the country and I wouldn't, and manufacturing and, well, there's a, a larger question is what is manufacturing without services? A lot of manufacturing products are, in fact, contain a lot of services product and, and whatnot. But uh, on specific tasks, it really depends on where your comparative advantage is. And in many countries, including my own, which is a European country, Poland, uh, it still has a very competitive labor force and this is how it's competing and this is how it's generating value. So manufacturing shouldn't be thrown out of the basket. Thank you.
Thank you. I'd like to first thank all the panelists for great uh, presentations, but also thank the audience for great questions. <laughs>